Hello, everyone, and welcome. This, my name is Monica Yandel. Uh, I'm at the University of Queensland, and uh, it's my role as chair today to welcome you to our prevention and implementation science challenges ahead for implementing preventive strategies in oncology uh, session of the Psycho-Oncology 2021 scientific meeting. First of all, I would very much like to acknowledge the First Nations people um, on the lands on which we meet today, um, who have for many thousands of years uh, looked after this land and who have been really successful in undertaking preventive action, observing nature and keeping country healthy. And so we hope that um, our session will help us to follow in their footsteps with regards to our focus on preventative care in the future. I would like to acknowledge my uh, co-chairs, Nicole Rankin and Caroline Masariego who have been instrumental to bring this uh, session together and also the ever so energetic Bonnie Lexton Lincoln without whom this wouldn't be happening. Uh, so thank you uh, very much for helping to uh, bring us all together today, which will be a very exciting program. We have an amazing set of speakers uh, for you, um, and we would very much like to encourage you to actively participate in the session. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, uh, button, which is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we would prefer the Q&A button rather than the chat button if you can, because it helps us to move uh, questions that have been answered into, the, into a separate field and, and helps us to keep track of all your, of all your questions and the answers. And we can also answer any questions live that we don't get to in uh, the discussion. So Q&A button if, uh, if possible. So now uh, I would like to introduce uh, our first speaker uh, for this morning, uh, Professor Don Nutbin. And uh, he probably doesn't need uh, to uh, get very many introductions. But anyways, uh, Don is currently uh, Executive Director of Sydney Health Partners and a Professor of Public Health at the University of Sydney and very importantly, uh, was intimately involved in uh, creating the new national preventive policy um, that is about to be presented by um, Health Minister um, Greg Hunt on uh, the upcoming Monday. And uh, I'm pretty sure many of you will have subscribed to that presentation next Monday already, but Don will give us a little bit of a preview and also uh, some of his thoughts on uh, what we can expect from, uh, from the upcoming uh, new policy. So over to you, Don, if you would like to uh, share your screen. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks uh, very much, um, Monica. And um, if um, I can add my acknowledgement to, um, uh, of the custodians of the land on which we all meet. In my case, it's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are with us today. Um, uh, as Monica has mentioned, um, I was involved um, uh, two years ago now um, in, um, just see if, sorry, I'm a male, I can only do one thing at a time. Um, there we go. Um, I was involved uh, two years ago um, in a lot of the developmental work that went into the creation of the National Prevention Strategy. Um, I was sitting really comfortably um, in my presentation today, imagining that the strategy wouldn't be released until uh, sometime in the middle of next year. But um, since Greg Hunt's announced his retirement, he's shifting a lot of stuff a bit faster than I expected. So um, what would have been idle speculation that you'll have all forgotten about um, by the middle of next year um, is actually going to go public on Monday. And so what I have to say may differ significantly from what's actually published um, on Monday, but it is my best understanding of what was in the last draft um, that I saw, but you can never be sure um, how these things will unfold. Uh, what, what I'd like to do um, very briefly is, is um, just draw your attention to the foundations on which the strategy was built, um, and in particular looking at past successes in prevention, particularly Australia's experience, um, in the past and, and think about how we, we extract some generalizable lessons about how you achieve success in prevention. Um, look at where we've got to with the National Preventive Health Strategy, or at least the last version that, um, that I saw, um, uh, highlight some of the issues and challenges that I think we faced along the way. 
um, and then invite your discussion, um, whether that's in session or out of session, um, I don't mind, but I hope it stimulates a bit of discussion. J just in terms of foundations, um, we're, we are blessed in Australia in having uh, the Australian Institute for um, Health and Welfare who produce some fantastic, um, easily navigable data that help us get a snapshot of the state of health in Australia on a very regular basis. Um, and I just plucked this off, a couple of things off the uh, AHW um, uh, website because they're a really important reminder uh, that when you're developing a national strategy for prevention, you do need to focus on the things um, that you know, cause the most ill health, cause the greatest burden of disease in Australia um, as a priority. Um, and you need to have an eye to trends uh, you know, what's increasing in its importance and what's decreasing in its importance. And um, uh, well, well, the simple fact of the matter, of course, is that uh, uh, cardiovascular disease and cancers of various type remain um, the, you know, the, the most important um, uh, cause, cause of the burden of disease in Australia. Um, and, and whilst um, uh, your successes um, have actually led to some significant reductions in their impact on the population, they remain um, the most common causes of preventable ill health and a premature death um, in uh, Australia. Uh, but uh, alongside your success, um, there have also been some relative increases um, uh, in um, health problems, uh, most notably dementia, but also musculoskeletal disease as the population ages, chronic kidney disease, um, uh, and disappointingly for Australia, I think suicide and self-harm uh, have all been on the increase um, over the last decade or so, uh, sorry, the last 20 years or so. Um, the critical question is, what can we do about it? Um, uh, how do you go about attacking this? Um, how do you prevent um, uh, preventable ill health and premature death? Uh, and you'll all be very familiar with this kind of analysis which looks at a range of personal behaviors uh, and environmental risks. And it's one of the most common ways in which we answer the question, where do we need to focus our attention? Uh, but of course, there are other ways of asking that question. Um, and another way of looking at it is some of the broader social and economic determinants of health. Um, and the fact that we, we have um, more than 30% um, variance um, between uh, different population groups, excuse me, I forgot to turn my phone off. Um, uh, we have significant variation between our population groups, um, uh, particularly between um, uh, the highest and, and, uh, and lowest. And so one of the questions you have to ask is what role um, does addressing the socioeconomic determinants play in a preventive um, strategy? Because of course that moves us past uh, some of the things that we've conventionally um, focused on. And uh, again, I, I suspect many of you are familiar uh, with uh, the work done um, through the World Health Organization um, on social determinants. The simple fact of the matter, as I've highlighted on this slide in bold, um, that it's always been the case um, for those of us who work in public health, uh, we've always understood um, that addressing public health problems requires us to look at some of the underlying social economic and environmental conditions that drive these along, as well as, it's not, in a, it's not um, uh, as an alternative to, but as well as focusing on individual behaviors and choices. And the, the answer is always, it has to be a, a bit of both. Um, one of the things we, we started with right at the beginning, um, and I'll, I've added a please discuss comment uh, at several points along the way here, but, um, uh, it, it is just simply um, uh, just simply how we um, uh, um, determine or how we prioritize within an overall strategy between um, options that focus on encouraging people to make healthy choices for themselves and their families, um, the role of government uh, and in our broader community and society in acting on some of the social determinants of health to make um, healthy options more available for everyone. Uh, and, uh, you know, more recently, I think a much clearer focus on tackling uh, existential threats such as climate change and uh, the related environmental um, stewardship. Of course, depending on your choice um, of, uh, choice of orientation, it will have a fundamental impact on the strategy 
uh, that you that you might adopt. And uh, that was something that occupied a lot of discussion early on. And the answer, of course, is it, it's never either or. Um, it has to be all of these things. But the relative balance is a significant political decision for governments. We did. Uh, we are fortunate in Australia in, in having a lot of really good examples to choose from. And if you're not familiar with this document published by the um, uh, Public Health Association of Australia, um, I can really strongly recommend it to you. It, it, it's a, a couple of years old now, but it, it highlights 10 success public health success stories from the previous um, 20 years uh, and um, does extract some really important generalizable learning that was really very helpful in helping us to frame the national prevention uh, national prevention strategy. Um, uh, what I've done is extracted very uh, uh, just because time won't allow me to get into any more detail, taken one that might be of some interest uh, to you, and that is the, the extraordinary success we've had in Australia over a prolonged period of time um, in reducing tobacco use, um, uh, particularly in the adult population, but also successful um, uh, among young people. And what's critical in this, um, uh, the bottom line there is that this has been sustained and supported at scale for almost 50 years now. Um, and it has involved multiple components reflecting each of those strategic approaches that I mentioned earlier. It has involved consistent public education, including both generic um, campaigning as well as this much more targeted communication. Um, as well as um, some really pioneering um, plain packaging and health warnings um, uh, on tobacco products. It's involved practical assistance um, to people um, who want to quit smoking. It's involved uh, consistent and um, incrementally stronger uh, regulation, uh, particularly of supply, um, access, um, and promotion um, of tobacco products. So there's been a very important role for government um, in regulating access and use of tobacco products. And finally, um, it has involved fiscal measures as well. So different parts of government, those involved um, not only in health, but in, in other parts of government have had responsibility for this comprehensive program. Um, really don't have time to get into this, but some fantastic work that's published um, that I suspect some of you will be aware of and can access. Um, really looking at the timeline and the relative contributions of cessation, promotion and assistance, retail restrictions, uh, packaging and health warnings, regulation of uh, where people can smoke, um, fiscal measures um, and industry regulation and so on over a prolonged period of time. Uh, and what you see from this, this is a sort of similar summary of these um, actions. Um, aligned with a, uh, uh, with, a, with a graph showing the progressive and continuing reduction um, in smoking prevalence. And we, we have one of the lowest smoking prevalence rates um, among adults um, in um, the developed world. Uh, what's also been impressive and, and heartening is that alongside this, we've also seen prolonged progressive uh, reduction um, in smoking among younger people as well, which has been something that many countries have struggled with. So it's been a really important um, set of lessons that we've learned about how successful programs can and should be implemented. Having said all of that, of course, um, what you'll see from this graph is that um, the social gap, uh, the, the, the different social and economic group gap in Australia um, uh, has actually increased over this period. So although there's been an overall reduction um, in smoking, a, a significant overall reduction in smoking, um, the, 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 the reduction has been fastest uh, among those um, who are most advantaged in our populations and something we have to keep an eye on at all times that overall progress may mask um, uh, growing social uh, inequalities. So um, where we got in our discussions was, um, you know, what should a national pre prevention strategy actually look like? What, what, what needed to be done? 
Uh, and some of the things that fit with those broad strategic choices that I, I mentioned to you earlier were, for example, should we be looking for better funding for prevention services? Should we be working through and with NGOs and community groups so that we get directly to individuals and communities? Um, you know, how important in all of this is the provision of accessible, credible and understandable information for individuals and um, the importance of that has really been amplified through the current pandemic. Um, and how important is it to have a mechanism that would allow us to coordinate policy across government? Again, that's a please discuss thing. Um, so process um, uh, thus far until Monday, um, it's been a highly consultative process. We've made um, really great use of the best available international evidence um, uh, uh, and our own national experiences in Australia, a whole set of uh, different consultations um, and a really challenging um, task of looking across a whole range of other national strategies, action plans and frameworks to try to make sure uh, there is alignment between what's being recommended through this um, programme. So where did we get to? Um, and as I say, I'll be interested to see how this differs from uh, what actually emerges on uh, Monday. Um, four um, primary goals. So it's a strategy for all Australians. I think the minister was really keen to emphasise the point he, get, he gets it, that, 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 that uh, the burden of disease is not equally distributed across all parts of society. Uh, so it's a strategy for all Australians. Four key focal points. First of all, providing the best start to life, children growing up in communities that nurture their healthy development. Uh, secondly, um, living well for longer. Uh, this idea of adding health to life, that it's not all about increasing life expectancy, it's about improving healthy life expectancy. Um, focusing attention um, on inequities in health, um, understanding that we need to make improvements faster in the populations um, that at the moment are not enjoying the same level of health as the rest of Australia. Um, and finally, um, one of the most challenging parts of this is working out how we fund this um, and trying to ensure that future funding in our health system in particular is rebalanced towards prevention. There is a, a, a sense that, um, uh, that the health system um, needs to provide leadership but that um, overall, uh, this will require action um, across different sectors, um, across governments, both state and federal, um, and that there has to be some way of joining this up optimally. And finally, uh, an understanding that it's not just about focusing on the individuals, uh, but also in creating environments that will support health and healthy living. Um, uh, there's a very big commitment to engagement um, uh, and related to this, a very strong focus on ensuring that all Australians have access to the best available, most reliable and trustworthy health information um, to them. And interestingly, one of the first um, uh, elements of this strategy that is already underway um, is the development of a national health literacy strategy. Uh, and of course, um, something that was added rather rapidly in the last year was that prevention efforts have to be adapted to emerging issues and new science. And that's a nod, of course, uh, to what we've learned through uh, the pandemic. The last part of it is um, how do we create a prevention system to support action um, on all of this? Um, uh, and that includes elements around um, where, where's, where's the leadership coming from and what's the right governance for something like this? particularly in a federated system uh, that we have um, in Australia. Um, uh, we, we have to look at what it is, uh, particularly through um, our funding and organisational arrangements within the health system as to what it is that will drive um, a progressive focus um, on um, uh, prevention. Uh, we, we do, as I mentioned, the government's already taken some action uh, to try to um, build an infrastructure for improving health literacy. Um, and sitting behind all of this, we need to capture uh, the learning. Uh, question for you, where does implementation science fit in all of this and how can it drive 
such a system. For me, through Nicole's um, uh, patient tutoring, um, I've learned a great deal about implementation science over the last couple of years. And it's very clear to me that there's a, a major transfer of learning uh, that ought to occur as we move from a strategy to its implementation. The last thing uh, I wanted to mention again uh, of relevance um, to your discussions this morning is just how we advance the science um, of prevention. Um, I couldn't help but mention that uh, more than a decade ago, I did a review on behalf of the NHMRC into the state of public health research funding. Um, and not surprisingly, uh, we, um, uh, we recommended firstly a more strategic focus, uh, but really importantly, a strong focus on intervention and on implementation research. I'd have to say I'm not yet convinced that the recommendations we made a decade ago um, have actually been um, actively taken up, um, but I remain ever optimistic and look forward to your advice um, and feedback going forward. Thanks very much for your attention this morning. Thank you very much, uh, Don, for this introduction and raising the important points. And we're all very much looking forward to the presentation on Monday by the Health Minister to see um, whether the hard work that you and others have put into the strategy has, uh, has come to fruition. So thank you for doing that and driving the agenda of prevention for all of us. Um, it's really, really important. Um, so we have one question already there in, oh no. We have one question I think that Joe would like to ask. Um, if Joe would like to oh, ask yes. our questions. All right. Um, so the question I had was, um, is there any plan for the integration of the prevention um, strategy with the development of the new cancer plan that's currently being uh, drafted uh, by Cancer Australia? So um, one of the biggest challenges I think we have, but, but most practical challenge we had was finding the right way of integrating um, a, a very large number, more than 30 um, national plans, strategies and frameworks that were at various stages of maturity in a way that was coherent. Um, both for those plans under development and the national preventive strategy that was intended to be more of a, an overarching and umbrella strategy. So, so all I can tell you is that intense discussions have been going on through the, throughout the entire period, mainly because the government honestly doesn't want to contradict itself um, by publishing one plan that somehow seems to be at odds with, a, with another. So, so all I can say is I know the dialogue has occurred. Inevitably, uh, a national cancer plan will have a, diff a, a broader cancer focus and some different emphases. Um, uh, and separately, I might say there's a very strong national um, tobacco plan and uh, a national obesity plan and, and various other plans that would intersect I think, uh, with each of these. So, so I know a diligent effort has been made to ensure that there's as much consistency and coherence as possible. Honestly, I thought it was impossible. And I was glad that it was a group of civil servants who were trying to work on that. And it wasn't something that was asked of us. I think our role and responsibility was to provide the best possible advice and to accept that once provided, that advice needed to be sort of socialized across government, if I can put it like that. So, so you know, these things are ultimately constructed in a politicized environment. And, um, and I don't mean that negatively, that's the nature of a democracy. Um, and, and so we provide advice and we have to then accept that it, it gets socialized within government. And, and that's what's been going on behind the scenes. Thanks. Thanks very much. And, and Joe, you raise a really important point because uh, people might be aware that Cancer Australia has called for input into the new uh, cancer plan. And so uh, prevention should focus prominently and also, of course, implementation of evidence. So it's probably a good reminder for people to get online and, and, uh, and, and, and put, um, in, provide input into that plan. And maybe POCO can again take a lead on uh, a combined submission uh, potentially going forward. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Don. Uh, it's been really, really great and fantastic to have you. And I hope you can uh, stay and join um, the discussion further on. So next, I would like to introduce uh, Caroline um, Mezzariego, the co-host uh, of this um, fantastic symposium. And uh, Don has mentioned the importance of implementation in all kinds of um, preventive action. And Caroline will give us a just very brief five minute uh, overview of um, how implementation can work in all kinds, uh, all stages of research. Over to you, Caroline. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Monica. And as those before me, um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're all gathering today. For me, that is the um, Gadigal people of the Iwar Nation, and I pay respects to their elders past and present. So as Monica said, um, I'm Carolyn. I am one of the co-chairs of the Inspire Group, uh, along with my co-chair, Dr. Nicole Rankin, who you'll hear, who you'll hear from um, both her and her research later in the program. Um, but now, uh, as Dawn has so eloquently and um, robustly covered uh, the prevention side of things, thought that we should cover um, the implementation side of things too, and how implementation might be relevant across all stages of research, really looking at when is it, when is it appropriate to start considering implementation. So to start, I know we have um, a mixed group today, and some of you may not be aware of what implementation science is, so I, got, I thought I'd put us all on the same page first. So implementation science uh, is the study of uh, the use of strategies uh, that adopt uh, and integrate evidence-based health interventions into clinical and community settings um, with the ultimate aim to improve patient outcomes and benefit population health. So ultimately it helps or it hopes to bridge the divide between uh, research evidence uh, and practice. So that's really bringing about bringing programs that work into practice. Um, and the application of implementation science can help us understand uh, how to best use specific interventions and strategies that have been proven you know, to be effective in, in similar settings. So let's talk terminology. I think there's always some confusion between what is dissemination is what and what is implementation. Uh, well, dissemination actually refers to the intentional process to spread information and interventions to a target audience. But implementation is really, you know, a systematic science um, with the process of integrating a specific intervention into practice within an organization or system. So some of you might have seen this um, this great. Uh, tool or way of looking at uh, implementation using non-specific or non-scientific language, which I find to be very helpful, um, from Jeffrey Curran. So he says that the intervention practice or the innovation is the thing. Uh, effectiveness research looks at whether the thing works. Implementation research looks at how best to help people or places do the thing. Uh, implementation strategies are the stuff that we do to try to help people and places do the thing. And the main implementation outcomes are how much and how well are they doing the thing. So to look at implementation, you would use you know, implementation research methods. So it really starts with the evidence-based intervention itself or the what, the implementation strategy is the how. Um, and then that would lead on to facilitation of different outcomes and each outcome sort of builds on each other. So we have the implementation outcomes that then could lead to effective you know, service outcomes. And then ultimately what our main goal would be is to impact health outcomes, such as satisfaction, patient satisfaction function and a reduction of um, unwanted symptoms or, or what their health status is. So traditionally, when has implementation actually been considered? Well, if we look at it from the perspective of the research translation continuum, implementation is usually considered in these last two stages, T3, T4. So that's the translation of research to practice and translation to communities. And I guess most notably over the past um, you know, few decades, I guess, uh, this idea of the hybrid trials have come uh, really, po really popularized and into play. And hybrid trials um, really sit at that end of the spectrum as well within the T3, T4. Um, but what we're posing to you is that perhaps implementation should be considered even earlier and at all stages of research. So the question then becomes, when can implementation be considered? And this here is um, a figure from Harvard Catalyst, uh, which you know, they're really saying to us, you should consider implementation from the outset, which we definitely agree with. 
Um, and that this is their um, equation of the, the research translation continuum, um, looking at you know, the real world relevance across the phases of research. Um, and so we come to the justification that implementation should be considered at all stages of research, but really we have to think about you know, our justification as to why rather than just saying it. So myself and a few other um, implementation scientists have come together and we're kind of throwing around these ideas uh, to, to understand and to come up with reasons or justifications, as you know, uh, research is all about evidence as to why implementation should be considered early. So considering implementation early, we should go you know, back to the root of uh, what, the, what the main, what our current contextual issues are. So when we talk about the challenges, we know that translating evidence into practice is a notorious challenge for health systems and really billions of research are, I guess you could say, wasted or are not taken up each year, which widens that evidence practice gap that I mentioned earlier. And we still have quite limited learnings in terms of um, you know, previous attempts, whether failed or successful, um, of implementation and, and how implementation actually was facilitated for the successful interventions, but also what are the learnings of those that you know, might not have been successful. So how can implementation science uh, solve that problem? Well, we believe that strategic implementation planning could provide insight on what to consider later down the line when an intervention has already been proven to be efficacious and effective. And we're deeming this, you know, designing for implementation. So if you're still unsure as to, uh, you know, why you should place yourself ahead of the implementation game, well, we've got five other, um, justifications as to why you potentially should. So late implementation considerations may require, you know, significant changes to the intervention itself. So if we don't consider implementation until we've already proven effectiveness of an intervention, then, you know, we may actually need to go back and change that intervention itself, which may impact on the effectiveness that we've already um, described based on moving from, you know, the research world to a real world um, scenario. So if you consider implementation from the outset, you'll be able to pinpoint, you know, certain factors that may or may not need to be changed when moving from one um, realm to the other. Some interventions um, can also actually be really rapidly integrated. Um, and early implementation considerations could actually prime the system. And the best example I could give for that would actually be, you know, the topical example, I guess, is the COVID vaccine. Obviously, that was quite rapidly integrated, but probably had a lot of implementation issues that may be um, or could have been overcome had we thought about implementation quite early on. Finally, there's sort of a, dis a sequential approach to the research translation continuum, and that is that um, you know, one step leads to the other, and that's really no longer meeting the needs of the research, um, you know, the, or our research space anymore, especially with things like, um, or the next point, you know, the integration of efficacy trials with point of care um, or healthcare delivery models. So looking at something like a precision medicine trial where, um, you know, we're still developing efficacy of certain uh, treatments, but that is actually what a real life patient is um, is undertaking as treatment, so it kind of you know juxtaposes the different um, the different phases of the research translation continuum. So thinking about implementation too late um, might not be the best way to go. And finally, there's a potential for you know the reduction of downstream research waste and to really increase our knowledge gain in terms of what might work in implementation. So I guess the question here would be, should you be considering implementation in your work? And the one question I would invite you all to ask yourself is, is your intervention intended for future use by patients or by the healthcare system? And if the answer is yes, then I would, cons I would suggest that you consider um, early implementation factors or at least explore implementation. Uh, how it might be relevant to you. And there are a multitude of different um, tools and methods you know, to use when considering implementation and what might be right at your stages of research. So just to conclude here, uh, we know implementation is definitely not linear and that research translation continuum presents it in sort of a linear way, um, but that really isn't meeting the needs of current research or innovation uptake. So we pose this idea of designing for implementation or planning strategically 
for implementation that could provide insight further down the line and also advance the literature of, or the science of implementation to guide future implementation um, efforts. And then uh, you should consider what might be right for your ongoing projects and whether considering implementation is something um, that you'd like to look at. Um, and considering that might give you and, or your intervention uh, the best chance for a contextual um, successful uptake. So I'm happy to chat about any of this uh, and thank you so much uh, for giving me the time. I'll just stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Caroline, for giving us such a great introduction to what implementation is and how it can be used. And uh, we now have um, a, a fantastic opportunity to see implementation research in action. And uh, our first speaker in our next session on prevention and implementation strategies in pre-implementation is um, Associate Professor Julia, uh, Professor Julia Brotherton. She is um, a public health physician and the medical director. We're rolling out the self-sampling. So fantastic work and thank you so much for presenting this to us. Um, I would like now to call on uh, uh, Dr. Rachel Dodd to share her slides. So um, Dr. Rachel Dodd is a senior research fellow at the Daffodil Center, University of Queensland and Cancer Council, New South Wales. And Rachel will talk to us today about lung cancer uh, screening awareness strategies. Over to you, uh, Rachel. Sorry, just struggling with the old unmute button still. Um, thanks so much for that, Julia. And that kind of leads quite nicely in with what you were just saying about um, starting education early. Um, so um, just before I start this talk, I just want to also begin um, by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, which are the traditional custodians of the land on which I am presenting from today, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And also extend my respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is more um, at very much the earlier stages, so looking at um, pre-implementation, so I'm going to talk about a systematic review that um, we've just completed looking at um, lung cancer screening awareness strategies. So just to give you a bit of background um, about lung cancer screening. So lung cancer screening trials and real world programs have um, shown uh, they've been clinically effective at detecting lung cancers at an early stage and reducing mortality. And a national inquiry into lung cancer screening, which was um, which came out um, late last year, estimated that around um, just over 12,000 uh, deaths would be prevented and over 70% of all screening detected lung cancer would be diagnosed at an early stage. And the inquiry also estimated that around 580,000 Australians would be eligible for screening on completion of the risk assessment tool. Now, just on a very basic level, um, the for kind of risk assessment, um, some of the trials have been using um, age and smoke and um, history of smoking for their risk assessment. So um, for the uh, trial in the US, this was um, people aged 55 years and over with a history, um, smoking history of 30 pack years. So more recently, the federal government has allocated almost 7 million in funding to further investigate feasibility of workforce infrastructure, data information and communication systems, as well as um, stakeholder engagement for a potential lung cancer screening program in Australia. So currently only South Korea has got a nationally coordinated program, but lung cancer screening is included in policy statements and clinical guidelines in the US and the UK. And this map here just gives you a brief overview um, of what's happening internationally. So here you can see in Europe, there's been some um, trials and pilot programs into lung cancer screening, as well as in Canada and in Brazil. And in Australia and New Zealand, we're very much still exploring the feasibility. Um, but in the US, um, the recommendations from the US um, Preventive Services Task Force um, recommend lung cancer screening for those aged um, initially, the recommendation was for those aged over 55, um, but now it's, for, um, it's just recently been reduced to those aged over 50. Um, so um, with that smoking history that I'd spoken about earlier. Um, so although these recommendations um, are, are implemented in the US, the uptake has been extremely variable um, and uptake has been shown to be as low as 4% nationally. Um, but when looking at it state based, it's varied from between around 5% um, and up to 20% in Florida. 
So we know that uptake is fundamental to success of a screening program and lack of awareness um, is a barrier to screening. And we've recently conducted some focus groups with health professionals. And one of the key um, overarching themes was that we need awareness and education campaigns, both for the community and for health professionals. And that it's crucial to understand what key messages and strategies might be successful prior to implementation. So this was the research question for the systematic review. So we wanted to see what education messages and strategies are used to inform the public, people at high risk. So those are those that could be potential screening candidates and healthcare providers about lung cancer screening. So just a very brief um, overview of our methods. So we searched Medline and based Psych Info and Sinal, um, and the search was conducted on the 20th of November last year. Um, and we've had two researchers independently screening titles, abstracts and full text. And we also conducted um, a backward and forward citation search in June this year. And um, the quality of each study was assessed using Joanna Briggs critical, critical appraisal tools. So for our eligibility criteria, we included um, any studies which included those of the general population, um, potential screening candidates and health professionals. We really wanted to also include those with the general population because um, some of our researchers has suggested that it may not be, um, we shouldn't just focus on those that could be potentially eligible, but also those um, that could talk to them about screening, whether it be family, friends, work colleagues, etc. Um, so we also we wanted to examine uh, studies that had key messages um, and strategies which influenced awareness of lung cancer screening. These um, studies could be either quantitative or qualitative and include education program resources or and or awareness campaigns. So I also won't go into this in detail, but just um, showing you the Prisma um, flowchart. So we started with nearly 4,000 um, records identified. And um, after all the stages of the review, we included 21 studies. So out of the 21 studies, 19 of them, unsurprisingly, were in the US, given the fact that they um, have got the most amount of screening. Um, and one was in the UK and one was also in the Netherlands. So also reflecting where there is screening, um, either pilots or trials taking place. So 10, um, 10 of the studies were awareness campaigns. So this is those that had awareness as a primary outcome. Um, four of them were behavioral interventions. So a behavior was a primary outcome, such as a receipt of screening or speaking to a health professional about screening. And then we also had um, studies which assess perceptions and knowledge of lung cancer screening. So this might have been um, following viewing resources or exploring key messages through focus groups or other qualitative studies. So this slide will show you just how varied the strategies were. So um, I won't go into any of them in detail, but as you can see here, um, the strategies across the studies range from educational videos to, to education classes, including um, using uh, more intensive strategies, such as um, including a quit line coach messaging with, with brochures. Um, and then also in terms of health professionals, there was also varied um, varied strategies, which included grand round presentations and some educational dinners, which, um, which were run by uh, physician um, champions as well. So um, this slide also reflects some of the key information. So what do I mean by that? I mean, some of the consistent messaging that has occurred across some of the studies and reflects information that the participants found important. Um, now, it's important to have consistent messaging, and even if the strategies need to be adapted for different communities to enable equitable access to messaging, we need to make sure that this messaging is consistent. So really, we need to develop a toolbox of strategies um, which may work for different, for different communities. So here you can see some of the important information. Um, is important to include, such as the, the um, importance and benefits of early detection. Um, some participants expressed that they, they liked seeing the survivor testimonies, so seeing some people who had had lung cancer um, and they survived having been for lung cancer screening. Um, also linking messages to family, so not only looking at decision making within families, and, um, but also um, saying, you know, you want to be around if, if when your grandchildren grow up and things like that. Um, but also some of the other key information about eligibility, risk factors and symptoms, and also just practical information about where and how to access lung cancer screening. And so um, 
As you can see, the strategies to increase awareness were heterogeneous um, and some of the key messages and strategies were consistent across the studies. Um, but one of the things that we also want to do is um, harness lessons from other cancer screening programs as we are in different um, in different aspects of, of pre-implementation of potential of potential program, we need to look at the previous um, successes of the other cancer screening programs to see what what really worked. Um, so as we are in the pre-implementation planning phase of the potential organised cancer screening program in Australia, understanding which of these strategies might be successful can help us to plan um, what strategies and messaging might be successful when we do actually um, potentially implement lung cancer screening. So we also don't have an extensive evidence base um, that's available locally. So also drawing on some of these international examples is fundamental for developing um, some locally appropriate messaging and strategies that can be tested. And some of my future work will actually involve co-designing strategies with community members um, to support the decision making for lung cancer screening. So we really need a multi-pronged approach um, and that's what I'm hoping some of my co-design work will be able to do. So um, we need to develop different, as I said earlier, toolbox of strategies to ensure equitable access um, to lung cancer screening. And we also need um, high quality evidence of the most effective strategies um, so that to um, achieve successful implementation. And that's it from me. Thanks, Monica. Thank you very much. No, that's really interesting and, uh, and very um, interesting also that communication and the way we best communicate has come across in both those presentations in the first session today. So thank you very much for that, uh, Rachel. So we're now moving into our next session and um, this, this second session is about implementation strategies during a prevention or early detection trial. And our first presenter, Dr. Diona Ackerman will speak about SWOTs and how uh, we can use them to adjust intervention delivery and success. And if you're like me, um, I've never heard about SWOTS before, before Dee uh, introduced this concept to me. So very much looking forward uh, to your talk. Thank you, Dee. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Diona Ackerman um, and uh, my background's in general practice. And I'm undertaking a PhD looking at how SWOTs can improve trial processes and guide implementation in randomised controlled trials. Like the other presenters, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on, um, and that's Cameragal uh, land. So what are SWOTs? A SWOT is a study within a trial. And SWOTs were developed to improve trial efficiency and to increase the evidence base for trial process decisions. Because there's a paradox that exists in trial execution. We do clinical trials to generate evidence to improve patient outcomes. However, we conduct uh, clinical trials in an ad hoc way. We often do things the way they've always been done without evidence to support it. So with that in mind, the studies within a trial methodology has been developed to investigate trial design features and operational processes. So SWOTs are embedded within a host trial and classic SWOTs provide data to inform decisions about the ongoing host trial and also the design and conduct of future trials. So they commonly address things like recruitment and retention, but they could really look at anything from monitoring to staff training, data collection methods. SWOTs are becoming increasingly common in the United Kingdom with a number of initiatives providing funding and supporting for their inclusion in clinical trials. There's a SWOT repository to register SWOTs and Trial Forge has published guidance for defining and undertaking SWOTs. However, very few have been done in Australia. So at this point, you might be thinking, well, what's this got to do with implementation? So we're proposing a new uh, role for SWOTs in addition to their established function to improve and build an evidence base for trial process decisions. We think that SWOTs could be tools to help researchers customize the design and delivery of complex interventions within clinical trials. And we think that they could be tools to evaluate intervention adherence strategies. So in this new role, SWOTs could facilitate post-trial implementation. I'll just tell you a little bit about the host trial. The MALSELF uh, trial is a randomized controlled trial which compares patient-led surveillance with clinician-led surveillance in people who've been previously treated for localized melanoma. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about patient-led surveillance on the next slide. 
But essentially, we've tested patient-led surveillance with a pilot study, which has just been published in JAMA Dermatology. And uh, we enrolled 100 participants with 49 randomised to the intervention group and 51 to the control group. 66 people completed the trial and 26 of the 49 intervention participants successfully submitted dermoscopic in, um, images. So we really identified that participant adherence to the intervention was an area that we want to improve in our full trial, which we've just started recruitment for. So patient-led surveillance is a complex intervention that involves self-monitoring and multiple components, as you can see uh, with the schematic representation at the top of that slide. There are email reminders or text reminders. Uh, participants conduct skin self-examination. And then there's a store and forward teledermatology process, which is a complex process in itself, as patients have to take images of concerning lesions. And then they upload these images uh, using an app onto a platform where teledermatologists can view them. And then the teledermatologist feeds back the results to the participant. And if necessary, um, they have fast tracked unscheduled visits. So as you can see, it's a complex um, intervention with multiple components and conducting a trial of a complex intervention, intervention like this and planning for its implementation is particularly challenging because uncertainty can remain about specific components even after the trial is complete. So for example, for us, with regard to reminders, we're not sure what the best mode of delivery, timing, how often they should be sent, what's the best method of educating participants in skin self-examination, and with regard to the teledermatology process, um, what's the best way to train staff, participants, what's the best choice of dermatoscope for consumers. And then in addition, we want to maximise adherence at each stage of the intervention. So in, um, in our trial, uh, we're really aiming to improve trial processes. And one of the things that we really want to do is improve intervention adherence because non-adherence will lessen the contrast between randomised study groups and may result in a loss of statistical power and underestimation of both the efficacy and harms of the intervention. But we also really want to try and make these translational gains. So um, customise the design and delivery of different components of patient-led surveillance and identify and evaluate methods that could improve adherence to the intervention in clinical practice. So um, ideally, we'd like um, to allow, you know, if, uh, identify these methods to allow implementation into practice at an earlier stage. I'll just give you a quick rundown of a couple of the SWOTs that we're considering or that we're doing. The first one is a health um, technology comparison SWOT where we're comparing a lower cost non-polarised dermatoscope with a higher cost polarised dermatoscope. And then we'll look at outcomes like how many participants had successful um, submissions and the quality of images and the self-reported ease of use and any device deficiencies reported. And so this Dermatoscope comparison SWOT will help us uh, to improve trial processes and assist with early implementation decision making. With regard to trial processes, reliance on a single model of dermatoscope for the collection of trial data could expose the child to operational risk. Um, for example, failure to complete the trial if the technology is no longer produced or failure to collect outcome data due to device deficiencies. Um, and then with regard to the early implementation decision making, the comparative clinical effectiveness data that we generate in this trial setting could help um, support the transition of trial evidence into clinical practice. And the second SWOT that we're doing is around the reminder text messages. So te reminder text messages to participants improve intervention adherence and response rates in trials, but the specific strategies and schedules uh, to gain an optimal response is unclear. There are no recommendations regarding the timing or frequency or approach to non-responders. Uh, so we're going to conduct a SWOT to assess the effect of a theory-informed strategy for sending text prompts to participants. And so again, this SWOT may provide us with evidence to improve trial processes and also provide implementation guidance. 
So just in summary, we're extending the role of SWOTs in the MEL self trial. Uh, we're still looking at SWOTs to provide evidence that will improve trial processes, potentially benefiting the host trial and guiding operational decisions for future trials and thus fulfilling the definition of a classic SWOT. But we're also looking to provide evidence that may allow implementation into practice at an earlier stage. And for us, that's through evaluating the design and delivery of some of the components of our intervention and also through the evaluation of adherence strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dee, uh, for such a great and comprehensive um, um, presentation. There's one question for you, um, whether the teledermatology was facilitated by dermatologists or GP? Uh, yes, yeah, so the teledermatologists were dermatologists um, and um, so they, they did have some experience with teledermatology. Um, yeah. Okay. So I think um, the, this is really exciting because it could speed up the, um, the knowledge about the best implementation strategy doing these spots within trials. Uh, and it sort of hits multiple aims in, in the one goal. Um, um, it makes the trial maybe also a little bit more complex and a bit, bit, it could be a bit daunting for people to implement a spot within their trial. What would you say to, to people considering a spot? I think, you know, there's defi that's definitely true that um, sometimes sponsors don't want to add a SWOT um, because of additional expense. But then, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of benefits that may actually improve the functioning of the trial. And um, so there could be a lot of benefits in terms of just the trial operation, but also in terms of that early implementation. I see a question there about power and um, the... Okay. Um, so a SWOT shouldn't interfere with, with the scientific integrity of the, of the host trial at all. Uh, so it is a question then of whether you're powered to have, whether you have enough power to have a result from your SWOT within the study. Um, so that's a separate question, but it shouldn't interfere with the scientific integrity of the host trial. Great. Well, thank you so much. And we're really looking forward to hear about your results very soon. Oh, is there a question from Liz? Right. Thank you. Sorry, Madhika. Yeah, no, I do. Yeah. I do have a question. It's a fascinating presentation, and and this is maybe goes back to how long ago I learned um, clinical trials methodology. But so, how do you avoid confounding the, the questions that you're trying to answer in 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 the larger trial? Then. So, I mean, the, the participants for us, they'll be randomized separately. There's a, a second stage of randomization. Um, so, I mean, randomization, you know, should hopefully result in an equal distribution of confounders. Um, but so that, I guess that's the additional resourcing, though. So you, you have to be recruiting enough people that you can actually do that second level of randomization without compromising your primary outcome, I guess, in, in the larger trial. Uh, yeah, I mean, it. it we do, um, yeah, I guess we have um, considered the, uh, yeah, it was an additional step. Um, so it wasn't the initial, um, it was around the idea that we wanted to make sure that we had that guarantee with a second, say with a second dermatoscope that um, the, the one company, because sometimes negotiating with these companies is difficult. And if one trial, if you lose that contract with one operator, then you know the whole trial can fall over. So there's a real, I guess, benefit there. Yeah. yeah and I guess, and sorry, I'll stop after this. It's such a, a fascinating and important area. Just thinking about the um, kind of behavioral science and, and, and psychosocial type of, of trials that we often in, do in, in psycho-oncology where we really struggle to recruit. And, and so this, this, this type of, of um, SWOT methodology seems like it, it suits trials that, that where, where recruitment is, is not really the issue. And, yeah, although, I mean, certainly SWATs are done in, around recruitment. If that's an issue for you, then, then that can be something that you actually address with a SWAT. Um, if you can have, you know, some ideas around, um, then you can actually um, assess, assess it with a SWAT. Yeah. yeah. Oh, very, very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks for those questions. And um, it's now my great pleasure to um, hand over to my co-host, uh, Associate Professor Nicole Rankin who will speak to us about uh, lung cancer pre-implementation data. And Nicole, we are just running ever so slightly 
uh, behind. So um, I'm sorry, I will uh, put my hand up a, a bit earlier than planned uh, to stop you. Thank you. Okay, to unmute myself before I share my slides. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. I'm just going to try and get the um, slides working correctly. And off we go. Um, so I'd just like to begin by um, acknowledging um, the traditional owners of the land I'm on today, which is the Dharawal people in the northern Illawarra, and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and also to pay my respects to any um, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people on the call today. So my talk follows on quite nicely from um, Rachel's presentation in that I'm looking at implementation trials in lung cancer screening uh, to focus again as Dee did on that within trial or, or the, um, the actual activity of, of conducting trials uh, in the lung cancer screening setting. So I'm just um, really briefly, and this picks up a little bit on what um, Carolyn talked about earlier in terms of uh, terminology. And so um, just to bring your attention in terms of what are the uh, reporting guidelines or the resources available um, for implementation science studies. And the STARI statement makes some really clear um, distinctions between what is an intervention and what is an implementation strategy. And I don't think I need to go through that in detail, but I, I just wanted to um, set the scene to think that here in the presentation, I'm focusing um, very much on implementation strategies. Um, there's also some new guidance for designing and taking, undertaking randomised implementation trials um, that Luke Wolfenden and colleagues uh, have had published this year in the BMJ. And I think what's really helpful about this guidance is that it helps people to make distinctions about what are your research aims, who might be the target groups that are involved in an implementation trial, um, that the focus should be on um, explicitly testing the implementation strategy, whether that's audit and feedback, an education leaflet, or an education program for health providers is obviously a, a wide range of strategies that can be chosen from, but that we're not uh, retesting the effectiveness of the actual intervention. Uh, and that there are many and varied outcome measures. And again, that um, links in very much with Carolyn's presentation earlier today, just around the implementation health, um, health service and patient outcome measures. So what we're focusing in on is, again, not the effectiveness trials here in the research translation pipeline, but on the implementation trials here in thinking about how do we make a program work. So just to give you a little bit of context, um, lung cancer screening uses a targeted approach, as Rachel mentioned, and the test is a low dose um, CT scan. Uh, Rachel's already covered off a little bit on the eligibility criteria being around age and a person's smoking history, um, including for those people who have quit in the last 15 years. Targeted screening um, is really important because it can reduce the potential harms of unnecessary scans um, and investigations for people at low risk. It reduces um, the personal costs and inconvenience and anxiety of going for a test it improves the equity of access um, to make sure that those who benefit most from screening get an opportunity to screen. And it also reduces the financial costs of delivering a screening program. And I guess um, the presentation Julia gave really shows that um, even in a, a population-based screening framework, um, like for cervical cancer, um, having that risk-based assessment um, is where we're heading to more generally with screening programs. So what I wanted to do was just to emphasize, as um, we'd heard about earlier, that lung cancer screening um, clinical effectiveness is well and truly established to, through two very large trials, um, one of 53,000 people, the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial, and in Europe, the Nelson Trial, um, which was another 15,000 people, and combined these two trials um, show a reduction in mortality. And just as importantly, that 
um, with detecting cancer at an early stage, you have the opportunity um, to offer people surgical intervention um, when cure is possible. So the trial data um, shows um, that that um, early stage detection um, is there, and that's also then consistently been um, repeated in real world programs in North America and in the United Kingdom. So everything is pointing in the right direction. And you would think, therefore, we've got a great intervention. Why isn't it being taken up in practice? But we know, um, again, as Rachel hinted or talked about, um, uptake is low. Uh, in the Nelson trial, for example, it was about 25% of eligible participants took part. And there's just some more data about um, the, the change over the last five years that you see in the national programs um, that are running in the um, you know, United States, where we're still only getting about 20% participation uh, across those programs at the absolute maximum. So why essentially isn't lung cancer screening being taken up? Don't expect you to read all the details on this slide. This is more just to give people a sense of the um, enormous amount of barriers that are there um, at patient levels, provider levels and system levels. Um, and that uh, we essentially need to have implementation strategies to address all of these things and to match those strategies to what the barriers are. And of course, to maximize uh, the enablers or those facilitators that will work well to encourage people to screen. So here is an example of a lung cancer screening pathway from Canada. And you can see here, even in the first early stages of screening, there's all kinds of opportunities for us to improve uh, recruitment um, through specialized strategies. Um, the use of personal risk calculators is going to be the standard in an Australian program should it be funded. So there needs to be um, strategies to encourage people to use those um, calculators. There, um, as Rachel's talked about, community awareness campaigns. And then um, we also need to have strategies to offer smoking cessation to people who take part in lung cancer screening and to have shared decision-making consultations. And so there's an enormous amount of potential across um, even the beginning of the screening pathway. I wanted to bring your attention just to one particular implementation trial uh, which is the lung cancer screening uptake trial that Samantha Quaif and her colleagues um, have conducted in the UK. There's both a pro protocol paper and a results paper that you can read about this trial. And their aim was to evaluate the impact of a targeted intervention strategy, um, which uh, randomised people to either an intervention or a control group, um, when they were um, being invited to take part in a lung health check. So it's similar to our um, potential low dose uh, screening program with the addition of spirometry. The target groups um, were individual participants at high risk of lung cancer and specifically those from lower socio socioeconomic backgrounds. So in um, the UK setting, they um, targeted what they um, labelled as deprived communities uh, through general practice uh, and invited people to take part. And what was being tested in that intervention strategy was a standard um, set of resources plus an information le leaflet. And their outcome measures were to look at screening and secondary outcome measures. So another busy slide, don't expect you to read it, but that just shows you the process they went through um, to actually deliver that um, intervention, or sorry, implementation strategy um, to the uh, two groups. And there were three points of contact with participants in the trial. So a pre-invitation letter and an information booklet, the actual invitation with a pre-scheduled appointment to encourage people to attend, and a reminder re-invitation letter if people did not respond to um, options one or two. The intervention group received a targeted leaflet that replaced that information booklet. And there were some nuanced changes in the language um, that specifically encouraged people who were uh, current, currently smoking or who had quit smoking uh, to take part in the, in, the, um, in the opportunity to have screening. 
And not surprisingly, there was an enormous amount of qualitative um, work that led up to the point of delivering this implementation strategy of the, the, um, the resource uh, through co-design and consultation with community members. Um, and it was really to try and encourage those people from the hard, hard to reach groups to take part. So here's just a quick snapshot of what the pamphlet looked like, one side of it, um, and it was called an MOT for your lungs, which for um, people not from the UK, including myself, makes reference to a, um, a lung health check, or, or sorry, a, um, a car checkup. So your, your annual registration for your car. So they've, they've um, made a little play on that. And it gives people a whole lot of uh, information about what's involved in having a low dose CT scan. So I think the important thing um, to emphasise about the lung screen uptake trial is that um, while this study actually found that there um, ultimately was no difference between the intervention and control groups um, who received either the, the straight intervention strategy um, around the invitation or the invitation plus the pamphlet, um, there was really significant um, uptake of going for that lung health check. So when you compare this with the poor uptake in lung cancer screening trials that I presented about earlier and that Rachel also mentioned, um, really this trial should be viewed as a success because um, essentially then we have a great idea that inter invitation strategies do boost participation uh, in lower SES groups. Um, and while they found that people who smoked were less likely to participate in the trial than people who had quit smoking, they did actually um, boost the, the rates overall. So these, um, the rate of uptake actually compared, compared quite favourably with um, FOB testing in the commencement of bowel cancer screening. And I think I'm probably almost at time, but I'll just um, <laughs> quickly, one more slide. <laughs> Uh, just say in terms of um, lessons learned for implementation, um, we really do need to be able to generate evidence um, about what works in the real world. These sorts of strategies can directly impact on uptake and health outcomes. And there are multiple opportunities for implementation strategies and trials to be designed. Uh, and just to acknowledge the team that I've been working with and the funding um, that will enable us to conducted a similar trial to that um, in the Australian setting uh, next year. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Nicole. And please put your questions into the question and answer for Nicole to answer live uh, while we continue with our presentation. So that was really great uh, to see that these uh, strategies uh, helped, especially the lower socioeconomic groups to uh, uh, participate equally. Fantastic. So we're now moving on to our uh, last session for this um, uh, POCOC um, seminar, and uh, we are now looking at strategies in post implementation. And our next speaker is Ms. Louise Baldwin, who um, has um, uh, uh, worked for QUT um, for the last few years and is also conducting her PhD uh, through QUT, but is now leading Health and Social Change Australia, uh, an organization that helps uh, to uh, build programs, services, strategies, and policies to promote health. And uh, what Louise will be talking about is looking back at um, preventive um, programs and health promotion programs that have been conducted in Australia and what people say in hindsight, what they think um, is important to um, create these programs in a sustainable way. So I think very important data for the upcoming national strategy. Um, and so over to you, Louise, to present your, uh, your findings. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, much appreciated. I do hope you can hear me okay. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Lovely, thank you. Um, so I too would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, land which we all present today. Uh, myself in Brisbane on the lands of the Turrbal and the Yagara people uh, and pay my respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits. So continuing health promotion programs or any kind of prevention and early intervention programs in an ongoing manner is commonly referred to as sustainability. And that's something that um, uh, has certainly been alluded to throughout the presentations today. 
But we know that the evidence remains very fragmented on how we actually do this. And there's a lack of consensus on how to effectively sustain health promotion programs over time, particularly when initial funding periods have ceased. So we know that the need for more research has been identified. There's an absence of robust research paradigms and clear direction uh, and principles for sustainability of health promotion programs. There's also commonly cited deficits in health promotion um, current areas, including poor funding allocations. And of course, we heard Don talk about that earlier um, today. And also there's a delay in that trajectory of evidence into practice because of the time that it takes. So therefore our research aim to investigate uh, the factors that influence the lack of sustainability of chronic disease health promotion programs in Australia. So naturally cancer was a large focus of our work. Uh, we particularly focused on four risk factors uh, around sun protection, tobacco smoking, physical activity and nutrition. So the research methods, and I'll just go over these quickly before I share some of the uh, rolled up results with you. Um, this was an extensive study. We did a literature review. We also did the development um, and validation of a questionnaire tool because there wasn't an existing suitable data collection tool available for us to use. Uh, we undertook quite an extensive Delphi study, which I'll be sharing the um, early results with you today. Um, and then undertook the development of a framework for Australian health organisations um, to particularly use in chronic disease prevention, health promotion programs, or to guide any work in that prevention and early intervention space so we can potentially get the best possible sustainable outcomes. So focusing on the Delphi for the purposes of this presentation, um, as I mentioned, we developed and validated a Delphi questionnaire. So that in itself has been quite a contribution to the literature, uh, which we're just writing up at the moment in terms of um, that tool, which hopefully we will then be able to repeat at different stages over the coming years. We then undertook uh, a two round Delphi study with four different groups of participants. Um, and to do this actually took quite a, quite a lot of consideration and quite a lot of reference back to the literature, as well as to current practice as to who we included in the Delphi study. So we ended up um, identifying these four key groups of participants. So we had ec experts in health promotion and typically they were also working in the academic field, but not always. Um, we looked at government uh, staff, particularly those that led health promotion teams, chronic disease prevention strategies from a state government and territory government point of view. Um, we looked at the not-for-profit sector and particularly focused on a number of the larger not-for-profits that particularly focus on chronic disease prevention action. And then we also wanted to look at settings-based organisations. And this was important because um, similar to the, the troubles of that more linear approach to implementation that we've heard um, today as well, similarly with settings-based organisations, so they are like the overarching organisations that may focus on schools, workplaces, local governments. They're sometimes not involved in the very upstream work of health promotion and prevention programs, but they're very much um, crucial in terms of that implementation. Um, so we wanted to look at involving them from the start and maybe flipping some of that involvement from those key stakeholders into the future. Uh, and lastly, then for the Delphi, we uh, also had an international panel, which was an additional group of participants, um, purposefully selected international panel uh, who helped us review some of the outcomes and findings of, from our Australian Delphi study, and then also uh, talked about the relevance of that in their own country from a global perspective, and also provided comments on the draft framework that we developed as well. So um, the results of our study, these are again, just in the interest of time, some of the key themes and, and some of the rolled up findings. Um, we did talk about why sustain prevention though. We didn't want to assume that all of our participants thought that prevention should be sustained. Um, and these were some of the outcomes that came from that, that significant outcomes in prevention takes time. So we need to look at that, the, the long road and where that's going. 
the outcomes of prevention are strategic, they're cost effective, and they need to be embedded in systems long term. And this needs to be beyond political cycles. And you'll see this issue of political cycles come up over the next few slides. It was a very prominent finding from our, our Delphi study. Uh, we also know that without sustained effort, prevention can be seen as wasted resources or programs are often ceased before the outcomes can be shown. Um, and then there was a number of findings we had around uh, the expense on the health system, both from a positive point of view that we need to sustain prevention because we know from the predictive studies, uh, the long term costs savings for the health system. But we also know from some of the retrospective work that some of the maybe uh, less well planned prevention activities that have happened over the years may have actually been quite expensive to the health budgets. And that was also seen um, as a reason to look at this issue and work out how we can do it better. So some of the facilitators or enablers that we found from our Delphi study um, included that uh, well-planned programs that were ethical, they were based on needs and importantly based on evidence, um, were very important to enabling sustainability. Um, that it needed to be relevant to the population, but also importantly, with realistic and achievable aims, objectives and strategies. Um, and of course, having that embedded evaluation and you'll also see that come up as a bit of a trend here. Uh, we also found that an enabler was that approaches, programs, policies de uh, demonstrate effectiveness and had that continual quality improvement. Um, that was a very big point of view and again speaks to that notion that this is not always a linear approach, that all of these considerations in what we do really need to walk alongside each other. Um, and But we also had a, a significant finding in our Delphi study that just because things needed to be evidence-based, just because things needed to have a long-term didn't mean that we couldn't be innovative and try some really good things along the way and see if that worked and that innovation needed to come into play. Um, and again, that would enable us to respond to some of these things that uh, pop up unexpectedly, like those learnings from the, the pandemic that Don also mentioned earlier. Uh, we also found that an enabler uh, was funding from multiple sources, not just relying on the one source of funding. And we know that's an issue in practice. Um, and that also approaches and programs uh, that considered being low cost, cost appropriate, or had a cost effective analysis built into them was also an enabler for sustainability. Um, and the, the fourth key finding of this area, an obvious one for those of us that work in this space a lot, but it still doesn't always happen well in practice, is the need for community engagement, partnerships and buy-in from stakeholders. We know that some of the barriers, uh, and here's the government issues that came up time and time again, um, the government priorities changed um, and they were short-term government priorities. There was funding cuts and lack of ongoing funding for prevention and early intervention. Um, that the way programs had happened where there often wasn't time to properly review the evidence or sometimes for practitioners, a lack of access to the evidence to be able to move at the speed that they need to be able to move in also showed that sometimes it was difficult for the programs to show those outcomes and there often wasn't a robust evaluation built in. Again, it was sometimes left to the end. And by the time the evaluation came, the money was run out, the priorities had changed or the program had been ceased. So again, um, a very strong word to us to be able to look at all these elements and how they all walk alongside each other as we roll these approaches out. Um, and a number of barriers mentioned around uh, the health promotion workforce, some states and territories having that workforce removed at government changes, but also another barrier that we don't have a very strong and connected health promotion workforce in Australia. So uh, then we asked uh, participants how sustainability should be planned. Uh, partnership based, particularly looking at social determinants and of course, including community, um, identifying how to embed in systems, but also in existing staff structures. So not living in a bit of a, a mythical land where we're going to have heaps of staff working on this, understanding what we've got and working in that space. Um, the evidence based with stakeholder consultation and bringing that together um, and looking at that well-planned project design and again, looking at that progressive measuring um, across those critical success factors. 
Again, adequate staffing and capacity. And there was also a big issue about uh, that came out of our study, which was that we certainly need a dedicated workforce, but we need to build the capacity around prevention and early intervention right across the workforce as well, um, that it's not something that just one part of a workforce can hold on to. Um, that it needs to be part of strategic planning um, and not just based on we've done it all the time like this on historical service delivery, so we'll just keep rolling it out like that. That came out of very strong uh, government feedback, in fact. Um, and that sustainability uh, uh, areas need to be reviewed every three to five years uh, with those longer term approaches uh, in view of how it's planned. In terms of being assessed, um, measurable outcomes and good evaluation, uh, linking that then to the broader chronic disease data that we know we have nationally, um, that we need to develop a range of sustainability criteria um, and that that length of time in place with population support implementation and advocacy. So as I mentioned, um, this was part of a much broader study and they are some of the top line findings from our Delphi um, which we complemented with that lit review, the international panel, and then the development of that framework. So uh, a rapid little journey there through some of our study. Um, but please, of course, there's my contact details. I'm always happy to chat and uh, feel free to reach out to me there via email or LinkedIn. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Louise. Um, I think that's really great. You brought a very different perspective to uh, the topic of implementation looking at how government, um, community, and all stakeholders need to work together from the beginning to plan implementation um, uh, straight away to uh, make this happen, um, to make a sustainable health promotion program happen. So thank you very much, uh, Louise. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our last speaker for today, um, Professor uh, Liz Eaton, who many of you, uh, of course, will know, uh, head of school, um, School of Public Health at the University of Queensland. And um, Liz will, will um, finish us up with a very successful uh, program that has been uh, implemented widely, Healthy Living After Cancer. And so how was sustainability uh, built into this program and where's the program now? Over to you, Liz, thank you. Okay, thanks, Monica. You can see the, see the slide. Yes, we can see it really yeah, well and hear you. Okay, well, um, thank you. It's a real pleasure to present. And wow, what an amazing um, body of implementation expertise that, that we have here uh, amongst this group. It's been very, very exciting presentations. Um, I also just want to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners here in Brisbane, the Turbo and Yagra people, and in particular, any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander colleagues who have joined us today. So as Monica said, this project is well on the other end of the, the spectrum. It's a completed hybrid implementation effectiveness study. And what I'm gonna focus on today um, is what are the things we did in the context of the study to try to bake in sustainability uh, and then talk about where, where we are now and a few final reflections. So I'm gonna um, give you just a whirlwind of an overview. It'll be absolutely methods and results light because all of this has been presented and, and published numerous times excuse me, it um, was a NHMRC partnership project, so finished a little while ago, although it did go largely to the end of 2019. Our wonderful partners were council councils um, across, the, across the country, and I cannot say enough about how incredible um, cancer councils were as, as partners in this kind of work. So what we did in a very brief nutshell was we worked with them to integrate our evidence-based telephone health coaching program uh, which was targeting uh, health, health promotion, uh, health behavior change, and cancer survivors. We integrated this with them into their 13, 11, 20 cancer information and support service. So you'll um, see some familiar faces or familiar names amongst our list of uh, chief investigators, um, as well as um, associate investigators, as, uh, many of them uh, with our Cancer Council partners. And by way of very brief overview, it was a six month tele telephone health coaching program. Um, it was delivered by Cancer Council nurses themselves. So we taught them to uh, upskill them in, in the delivery of the intervention. Uh, the program was uh, available to any uh, adult diagnosed with any sort of cancer as long as they were had been treated with post, uh, uh, sorry, with curative intent and were in the post-treatment phase. And it targeted specifically physical activity, healthy eating and 
weight loss consistent with um, national and international guidelines for cancer survivorship around these. So there's a very detailed protocol paper um, and it was a, a hybrid um, implementation effectiveness trial. Um, our evaluation was, was pre-post um, based on, on self-reported um, data, again, consistent with this really being a, a national rollout of something that had been well tested in the context of numerous clinical trials. So um, in, in this trial context, we use the REAIM uh, evaluation framework as our, our primary framework. And, and with that, our primary outcomes were implementation um, outcomes that you see here. Uh, our secondary outcomes were, were patient reported or um, effectiveness outcomes. And of course, we also paid a lot of attention to participant and nurse feedback, a little bit of which I'll share with you today. I wanted to really spend the, the time because I think this is the primary focus of, of the talk, talking about what, what did we do to bake in sustainability from the outset? And I think Carolyn's talk earlier was um, really making this point that sustainability is, is something you have to think about at, at the outset, um, you know, outside of this whole translational pipeline. And certainly uh, we were thinking about it a lot in the context of this um, effectiveness implementation trial. So in the pre-funding stage, so before we, we ever got anything off, off the ground, um, my staff and I made a number of visits to cancer councils across the country to talk to them about the work we were doing in this space, to give presentations on our, our trial um, results, and really to engage with them as to whether um, scaling up the work and, and working with them to deliver it would be something of, of interest. Um, it was strongly in line with, with cancer council um, need to address health promotion in, in cancer survivors. And um, so the cancer councils were very um, supportive and, and wanting to continue engaging with us. We had a workshop to co-develop the partnership project proposal. Um, and we were fortunate to get it funded the first time around. So um, in the post-funding, but pre-study um, implementation phase, um, we had continued meetings with them to adapt and, and refine um, the project protocol. Um, Co-design, I suppose, wasn't a word that we were using as much um, back then, but we were certainly looking to work collaboratively with them. Um, we had what I've labeled here as a failed attempt um, to integrate the, uh, the delivery of the program fully in, into their databases. They were keen to look at that, but because we were collaborating with four council councils across the country and they all use different databases, um, they weren't as, as compatible or, or collaborative as um, as might have been optimal. Um, we conducted um, in-person workshops to, um, to train the Cancer Council nurses in the delivery of, of the program. Uh, and we also worked directly with Cancer Council research assistants to train them in, in the aspects of, um, of the program evaluation that were gonna be necessary. So it was very, very much upskilling Cancer Council staff to be able to both deliver and, and evaluate the program. So during implementation, uh, we, we again were, were very much hands-on in, in working closely with them. Our program manager checked in weekly with um, each of the, the key staff across each of the cancer councils. Um, and of course, we had data that we, that we were um, monitoring from our, um, from our database all the time on, on how, the, uh, how the program was being implemented, how many people were taking it up, how many intervention sessions were being delivered. Um, we had the nurses tape their calls more so initially and then kind of tapering off so that we could um, listen to them and, and give them some feedback to ensure quality assurance and, and ongoing skill building um, with the nurses um, kind of at their, at their request. We held monthly telephone case conferences to talk about um, individual participants in the, in the intervention and to share learnings and kind of develop a, a community of practice amongst the nurses. Um, eventually, because of um, staff turnover, we, we kind of worked ourselves into a train the trainer model with a, with a lead nurse at each of the cancer councils who took on a role of, of training new staff who might have been coming on to, uh, to assist with delivery. We did a midpoint nurse survey to get some assessment from them about how they were going, and, and that helped us to do um, an additional kind of booster, booster training session with them. Um, and then the last part, and this is a big, a big sigh from, from me, um, 18 months before the study and, and the funding was over, we attempted to start discussions around sustainability with the Cancer Councils and um, 
we just could not get any traction. And this this is in no way a criticism of, of them. I think it, it's just a reality of the, the challenges of working in with complex interventions and in complex organizations. Um, we even uh, did a, a detailed costing analysis to, to look at what it would take for them to deliver the intervention in an ongoing way outside the context of a study that perhaps shot ourselves in, in the foot because, um, yeah, that <laughs> being very specific about the ongoing costs, I, I think was, um, yeah, necessary and appropriate, but, but um, may, may not have made them so inclined to, to want to um, look at that kind of resource alloc allocation in an ongoing way. So, um, all right, well, that's, that's um, all of the things we, we did to, to give it our best shot at, at baking and sustainability, and where are we now? Um, Cancer Council, South Australia, um, with um, leadership from Lisa Beattie and her PhD student Morgan Lesk are um, developing an online version. Um, and there's very strong focus on co-design with consumers, um, addressing both the lifestyle issues of the previous program, uh, as well as client psychosocial needs. And, and that was based on um, program feedback. Um, the other council councils really not doing so much. New, New South Wales and WA were thinking that they might offer the program, that is the telephone sessions as a booster for those who completed a face-to-face -face exercise program. Um, I, I think that kind of waned over time. And, and the, yeah, I guess what, what we got from Vic Health at the end of our study was that they were considering what else they might do. I think it was a polite way of saying, um, no thanks. So uh, it's, it's really kind of down to, to South Australia now, and I've been fortunate to be able to collaborate with them. And, um, Bogda Kashwara is, is also strongly involved in supporting that effort. So it'll be great to, great to see where that goes in developing an on, online version. Um, so, okay, to finish up with, with just a little bit of nurse feedback, because it actually really goes to, I think, what you know, maybe got in the way of sustainability of, of the program. And then I'll just give some final reflections. So you can see here from the nurse's perspective, there were lots of positives of their own um, participation. Um, and I, I won't read that out for you. I think it's pretty straightforward, um, but there were also some real um, challenges. So uh, this, this was a complex intervention protocol. And I think everyone here is well aware of, of, of what that means to, to try to implement at scale and, and with partners. Um, uh, there were a lot of logistics about um, nurses needing to schedule calls and dealing with mixed calls. And, and this is when they were prior to this program, you know, on the 13, 11, 20 service, which was only a service that only dealt with incoming calls. So this, this involved them having a client that they followed over time and making a series of scheduled calls to the person over, over a six month period. So very, very different service model. Um, and, and then this issue of, of client psychosocial issues needing to be addressed, which in the context of our program um, was not part of the intervention. And so something that, that involved referral outside, uh, outside the study intervention itself. So my final slide, final reflections. Um, again, the, the Cancer Councils were wonderfully committed um, partners. But anyone who's worked with them knows that they're each independent. And so trying to work with them as, as a collective to implement something nationally um, had, its, had its challenges. Um, and, and there was a lot of staff turnover um, during the, the course of a, of a five-year study with them. It's a long period of time. And I've experienced this in, in every implementation trial. It's just incredibly challenging, particularly um, you know, as, as an academic wearing multiple hats to um, constantly re, uh, reform the, the relationship with, with new staff in, in the agencies with which you're partnering. It, it's in, absolutely important and it takes time. So final lessons, um, if I were doing this again, I'd certainly be looking to a much more simplified protocol and, and really more, even more co-design up, up front with the people on the ground who were going to be delivering. Um, I would be doing more of a pilot implementation phase to, to work out the bugs. Again, that, that's hard. We often don't get funded to do that kind of thing, but uh, I think it's necessary for scale up. Um, and, and then um, really this optimally, we'd be doing this type of thing in the context of a, a long-term and an, an embedded partner relationship. And when I say embedded, that maybe their staff were, um, you know, had a, had a um, joint appointment with us or, or vice versa so that, um, we really had the benefit of, of, of both sides and, and both expertise. So Monica, I'll stop. <laughs>
Well, thank you very much, Lisa, and congratulations on such a, such a successful project. And that is still ongoing. So while it may uh, live further in a slightly different uh, form uh, online or delivered digitally, I think it's testimony to the great work done by the team that um, it's being taken up now by Cancer Council South Australia and moved forward. Uh, can I ask all the panel members please to um, um, come off uh, mute and video and while they're doing that I would like to say thank you again for POCO to allow us to hold this session which combined um, the preventive uh, special interest group and the inspire special interest interest group of POCOC and if you are not yet a member I would very much encourage you to come on board in one or both of those special interest groups um, because I think really we all know that um, the best way to uh, deal with cancer is to prevent it and so if POCOC can contribute to that by bringing together all this massive expertise that we have here in Australia uh, with regards to research implementation health promotion um, that we have seen here today, then I think we can really make a big difference um, uh, to uh, cancer outcomes in the future. So we've got three minutes uh, left. So if there are any questions, I can see a question and answer there um, to Liz. Um, so Liz, the question was, what are the particular reasons that participation was limited to those post-treatment? Yeah, and so I guess our prevention topic, um, of course, uh, bears the question, should we do a similar pro pro program to prevent cancer? Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, great, it's a great question. And in this case, it's because um, the, the um, exercise component in particular was, was a home-based component. Um, and, and we didn't feel like for, for safety and risk and, and ethical considerations that um, we could do that at, at scale over the phone. Um, And there was another question, a sad response from other states. So I hope South Australia will support and take the program, which has great potential. Um, and that's also a message that um, as a pilot of a face-to-face -face healthy living after cancer in South Australia. So yeah, that's great to hear. Fantastic. Didn't know about that one. <laughs> great. Yeah, and then there's another just mention, I guess, to um, get the politicians to listen. So maybe Louisa, over to uh, Louise, uh, over to you. You are the expert there. How how do we get? Obviously, Don has left, so he could tell us a lot about it. But what's your view? Yeah, absolutely. Politicians crucial, and I think it's about us also having those short, medium, and long term outcomes, so that we as practitioners and researchers know that we're focusing on a long-term outcome, but we need to get better at having those short-term tangible outcomes as well so that we can fit those into the political cycles. And, and that's very doable. It's just about us adapting our practice a little bit. Great, okay. Thank you very much, Louise. I think we are at the end of our um, session, but if you have further questions, please continue to send them through and we'll, we'll um, answer them by email. Could, could I please put my hands together to thank all of our presenters today. It's been absolutely fantastic and I've learned a lot and I hope we can uh, keep the conversations going. So thank you. Thanks everyone and a really great um, effort and hope to see you very, very soon again. Um, Joe or Bonnie, do you wanna make any promotions for future um, sessions of the scientific meeting? Coming we have two sessions um, left to run on our um, scientific meeting. Tomorrow, um, 11.30, we're looking at the implications of COVID for cancer care. And on Friday, we are looking at fear of cancer recurrence. So both are very strong programs. So I would encourage people to uh, register. Thank you. Thanks everyone. And have a great rest of the afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. I think that went really well. Are you happy, Nicole, Carolyn, everyone, Bonnie? Yes. Yeah. Very happy. Sorry, I thought.